welcome to the second session of how I treat autoinflammatory disorders course. I'm Dr. Kosar Asma Shari, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Children's Medical Center, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, TUMS, Iran. And I'm the head of the executive team for the course. This course is programmed as a progression to how I treat series. How I treat series are educational programs planned by the leading house for Iran North America academic partnerships. Each of these programs try to provide information on basic knowledge and clinical experience related to treatment of a disease or an aspect of a disorder. If you let me, I want to share my slides when I want to explain more about our team. Dr. Shaheen, could you please? Okay, we will share the slide in quite a bit. Our course, How I Treat Autoinflammatory Disorders. Sorry, I should share the slides. Sorry, we're trying to share the slides. It's okay now. Thank you very much. Okay, sorry for the delay. Our course, How I Treat Autoinflammatory Disorders, includes eight to 10 sessions in which we discuss different aspects of autoinflammation, including pathogenesis, diagnosis, treatment, patient education, and network development. Our goal is to bring physicians, pediatricians, immunologists, and rheumatologists the latest updates on autoinflammatory disorders by the help of novel experts from different nations, USA, Germany, Turkey, and Iran as our speakers. In the light of these efforts, we hope a better understanding of the mysterious autoinflammatory disorders can be reached, leading to the rescue of the affected patients. I want to take a moment here and thank Dr. Vahid Ziai, head of our scientific committee, professor of pediatric rheumatology at Children's Medical Center, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, and the president of Pediatric Rheumatology Society of Iran for his full support of the course. We are also very grateful to Dr. Marjan Yagmai, head of Leading House for Iran North America Academic Partnerships for a kind support. I would also like to express my gratitude towards Professor Somera Farman Raja, Professor of Rheumatology and convener of Aplar Pediatric Rheumatology Special Interest Group. We are grateful for her kind support, which made it possible for our course to be endorsed by Aplar. Asia Pacific League of Associations for Rheumatology, or Aplar, was established in 1963 in Sydney. The World Known Association of Aplar aims to spread and strengthen rheumatology endeavors in the Asia Pacific region. Aplar's mission and goals focus on providing advanced care to patients with arthritis and other musculoskeletal diseases through the continuing professional development of members, increasing the awareness and understanding about rheumatic diseases, patient advocacy and empowerment and encouragement research in the uh, field of rheumatic diseases. If you wish to receive a certificate for each session of our course, you need to register via Appraise to Raise website, and the link can be seen here in my slides. You can also register for the whole course and receive a certificate of attendance in an international autoinflammatory course approved and validated by Asia Pacific League of Associations for Rheumatology, APLAR, Pediatric Rheumatology Society of Iran, Iranian Rheumatology Association, and Tehran University of Medical Sciences. For those who were not able to attend our first session, there is a possibility to view the video of the session on the website, answer to the post test, and receive the certificate for the session. If they attend the rest of the sessions and pass the post test, they're eligible to receive the course certificate. 
Today's session is entitled Approach to PFAPA Patients. We have three outstanding speakers today from USA, and I'm going to introduce them to you. First of all, Dr. Fatma Dedeoglu, who is one of the most elite pediatric rheumatologists in the world. We are truly grateful for his strong support in coordinating our sessions. Dr. Dedeoglu is an Associate Professor of Pediatric Rheumatology at Harvard Medical School and a staff clinician at Boston Children's Hospital, or BCH, in Immunology Division, providing care for children with autoinflammatory and autoimmune conditions, also primary immunodeficiency and allergies. Her publication on the largest pediatric series of patients with minocycline-induced autoimmunity was cited among the 50 best articles of the year in Journal Watch Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine. She has established an autoinflammatory clinic at BCH and manages a wide spectrum of patients with autoinflammatory diseases. She has contributed to the discovery of new diseases. She's also the co-director of Combined Rheumatology with Dermatology Clinic, where she takes care of rheumatologic patients with significant skin involvement. Dr. Dodoglu is actively involved in the activities of Pediatric Rheumatology Organization, or CARIA, Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Alliance, and co-led the establishment of the Autoinflammatory Study Group in 2012. She serves as one of the core members of several international autoinflammatory work groups, including ISS AID or International Society of Systemic Autoinflammatory Diseases. Our next speaker is Dr. Greg R. Licamilli. Professor Greg R. Licamilli is the director of Cochlear Implant Program and an attending surgeon of otolaryngology department in Boston Children's Hospital. He received his Bachelor's of Science degree from Embro University in Atlanta, Georgia. After college, he worked on a master's degree in genetics for two years at Embro University, then went to medical school for four years at the medical He completed a five-year residency program in otolaryngology at the Boston University Tufts University Combined Otolaryngology Residency Program. He then went to John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland for a one-year fellowship in pediatric otolaryngology. After training, he spent three years as an attending surgeon at the University of Illinois in Chicago, Illinois, then came to Boston Children's Hospital 23 years ago, where he is an assistant professor of otolaryngology and director of the cochlear implant program. He received his master's degree in healthcare management from the Harvard School of Public Health in 2006 and was the interim chair of the Department of Otolaryngology from 2008 to 2010. And our third speaker is Dr. Kalpana Mantiram. Dr. Mantiram is a clinical fellow at National Human Genome Research Institute. She's a pediatric infectious disease specialist in Bethesda, Maryland. She is affiliated with Boston Children's Hospital. She studies the genetic and immunologic underpinnings of inflammatory diseases of the tonsils. She takes care of patients with periodic fever syndromes, in particular PFAPA syndrome. Uh, I want to ask you, our dear participants, to share your ideas and ask your questions in the chat for room uh, while we are presenting these speeches. It is better if you address your questions to me, Kosar Asnarashari, as moderator. Uh, we could not have a live speech of Dr. Lekameli today, and that is why we are presenting the video that he sent us. I want to ask you, our dear participants, to share your ideas and ask your questions in the chat for room, but uh, better if you ask them after the speech of Dr. Lekameli and Dr. Montiram so that we can ask the questions from Dr. Montiram as we do not have Dr. Lekameli today with us. Now I invite you all to listen to the speech of Dr. Greg R. Lekameli. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. Today, I'd like to talk to you about periodic fever, atherostomatitis, pharyngitis, and adenoiditis, known as PFAPA syndrome. And I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing my colleagues, Fatma and Kalpana, to uh, present with me today on this topic. It is 
the most common periodic fever syndrome in children with a typical onset at around or just before five years of age. There's been studies to show the slight male predominance and there's an estimated 2.3 cases per 10,000 children in this age group. And the number of cases has identified over time uh, due to greater knowledge of this condition. The clinical presentation is that fevers occur with a very regular clockwork periodicity, typically every three to seven days, recurring within two to eight week time period. Typically, it's more in the four to six week time frame, with fevers between 39 and 40 degrees Celsius. To make this diagnosis, it is important to document at least five consecutive episodes and to note any infectious contacts, prior treatments, and outcomes. Pharyngitis is the most common presentation occurring over 90% of patients. It is variably described as being erythematous or exudative, and the tonsils are either normal or enlarged in size. It may be difficult to identify in very young children, and they may present primarily just as drooling with uh, an inability to feed. Cervical adenitis presents in 50 to 90% of cases. It's typically in the anterior cervical chains and bilateral with two to three centimeter lymph nodes uh, that are mobile with no overlying skin changes. Athos ulcers will occur in half of all patients seen. They're typically small, less than a centimeter in size and occur on the non masticatory surfaces. You may also look uh, in the posterior pharyngeal region and see smaller tonsil ulcers. Other symptoms include abdominal discomfort, muscle aches, headache, and nausea. And these symptoms, particularly joint pain, uh, are more common in adults. Other aspects of this presentation is that children have normal growth and development in between these fever episodes. The parents will also state that their child will present with a prodrome of feeling listless and irritable. Typically, there's no other sick contacts in the family, and there's no evidence of other causes for fever in the patient, such as otitis media. Over time, typically years, the fever intervals may become longer. And some patients may have a several month hiatus or break where there's no fevers occurring. And this may or may not uh, indicate the beginning of a, just a brief uh, respite or where it won't occur again. So the question is, is PFAPA a true auto inflammatory condition or is it an infection in a susceptible host? or does it include various conditions having very similar phenotype? If we consider it to be infection, things that weigh in its, that direction is that it is fevers that are transient, typically occur in the preschool age. There's a slight male predominance. There's no clear genetic basis for this. It is seen in most every ethnicity. There's an increase in episode frequency when giving steroids. There is a good response to tonsillectomy and blood work shows activation of the innate immunity. When we look at the factors that would support this as being an autoimmune disorder, one could see that it is again episodic. The lab changes are similar to other auto inflammatory diseases. There have been reports of familial cases. There is a very good response to steroids and a poor or absent response to antibiotics. There is a good response to tonsillectomy. In looking at the microbiology, there's no known or new pathogens that are isolated specifically with this condition. The immune pathways are, uh, identified are similar to other autoimmune diseases and mutations are, that have been identified also similar to other autoimmune diseases. So the differential diagnosis this is really a diagnosis of exclusion, and it has to be supported by negative throat cultures, absence of sick contacts, absence of cough, rhinorrhea, or other symptoms that would suggest a, uh, upper respiratory tract infection, the failure to respond to antibiotics, 
and the response to a single dose of corticosteroids. Typically, one dose will bring the fever down within 12 hours. Other things to consider include cyclical neutropenia, familial Mediterranean fever, mevalonic kinase deficiency, and tumor necrosis factor periodic syndrome. Medical treatment, PFAPA is definitely self-limited, but can significantly impact the quality of life of the patient and also it, the family. We give non at the onset of a fever and during a flare, and this will typically lessen the fever, but not completely. Cortical steroids are very effective, and a single dose at one milligram per kilogram will abort the fever cycle in 80 to 95% of uh, patients. However, it may cause the fevers to become more frequent. Cimetidine has been shown to reduce the frequency and severity and may induce complete remission. Colchicine has also been used and may reduce frequency, but it does not induce remission. And there may be a role in MEFV genetic variants. When we look at surgery, up, there is up to a 90% remission in the case series. There's been two small randomized control studies and more needs to be done along these lines. And some research uh, uh, topics include, does one need to remove the adenoids in addition to the tonsils? In my practice, I do both. What would be the efficacy of a tonsillotomy or a partial tonsillectomy? And then has the rate of surgical complications changed in this group? Uh, it, the studies have not shown anything uh, to that effect at this point, but the numbers need to be larger. Uh, when we look at the efficacy of surgery over medical treatment, there are certain groups that may not respond to tonsillectomy, including those who are MEFV heterogygous and adult patients. And still, recurrence of some symptoms is possible years later, but typically, if there is a recurrence, the symptoms are not quite as severe. In our own work here at Children's, we looked at the long-term surgical outcomes of adenotonsillectomy for this condition, and we had a total of 102 patients who underwent adenotonsillectomy from 2004 to 2011. The mean age at the time of surgery was 58 months. The duration of follow-up was, was approximately 43 months. And in our study, we found complete resolution of symptoms in 99 out of 102 patients. Thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, opportunity to speak with you. And certainly any uh, questions you may have can be emailed uh, to the address uh, that we show earlier. Thank you. Okay. I should ask Dr. Dudoglu and Dr. Monteram to send my sincere regards to Dr. Lika Mulli for this great speech. Uh, let's move on to the next speech, uh, Dr. Montreal's speech, and then we can ask the questions that you received from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and letting, thank you. Thank you, Kostar, for our honor. And thank for you. letting me share our uh, recent um, studies looking at the pathophysiology of uh, FAPA or PFAPA syndrome. Um, so uh, one of the first things that we noticed when we um, were thinking about how best to study the mechanism of PFAPA is that there appears to be familial clustering of the syndrome. So um, in this study of 80 patients who had FAPA syndrome, about 25% had a family member who had FAPA as well. And quite a few of them didn't really know that they had the syndrome, but on careful history, uh, we found that they had very frequent episodes of fever with the associated features as well. 
Um, and in most of those families, there's there appeared to be an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. But in addition to FAPA, we found that first degree relatives of patients with FAPA had also had a high incidence of not only FAPA, but also recurrent tonsillitis, recurrent strep throat, uh, recurrent aphthous ulcers, and tonsillectomy. So this graph shows the percentage of siblings among patients with FAPA in blue and uh, controls who did not have the disorder. And we find a higher um, prevalence of uh, these associated conditions, recurrent pharyngitis, recurrent aphthous ulcers, and tonsillectomy. Um, so I think it's very important to ask about family history in uh, patients who you suspect of having FAPA syndrome, because almost always you'll find that one of the parents had something similar, maybe does not rise to the um, uh, extent of uh, or the um, severity of fitting the diagnose, diagnostic criteria, but they may have had frequent tonsillitis or may have recurrent aphthous ulcers um, as uh, children or young adults. Um, and so th this triggered us to um, look at the genetics of uh, the syndrome. So in order to do that, we initially did whole exome sequencing on many familial uh, uh, cases of FAPA um, in order to find rare variants that have high penetrance and might explain the disease. However, those efforts were not successful and we weren't able to identify a single gene that uh, that um, when mutated led to the disorder. So we changed our approach at that point and hypothesized instead that FAPA is a complex genetic disorder, which means that many common genetic mutations, which may not be within the, even the gene um, uh, itself, but maybe in kind of regulatory regions of the DNA, that many common mutations contribute to the risk of the disease. Um, and many of those variants, as I said, may not be in co the coding regions. So they're in non-coding regions of the genome. There were two um, studies that caught our eye. Um, the first was a genome-wide association study of Bechet's disease, uh, which was done in Dr. Um, Dan Kastner's lab at the NIH. Um, I was a fellow in his lab. Um, and he looked at uh, patients with Bechet's disease and identified many uh, risk loci for the disorder um, using a genome-wide association study um, model. So uh, to do this, they um, a genotype uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms across the genome and see which ones are enriched in patients with Bechet's disease. And in Bechet's disease, we see that the MHC loci is um, the most uh, is, is the strongest risk factor for the disease, but there are also genetic mutations um, across the genome that contribute to um, a individual's risk for the disorder. Then shortly thereafter, another GWAS study came out for recurrent aphthous ulcers, and this was done um, in, from individuals from 23andMe and the UK Biobank and encompassed a very, very large number of, um, of uh, participants. Um, and they found many genetic loci that were also risk factors for recurrent aphthous ulcers. And interestingly, many of those were the same ones that were found for Bechet's disease. And because both of the, these diseases have the commonality of having recurrent af as of having aphthous ulcers in their presentation. We hypothesize that in FAPA also has recurrent aphthous ulcers. We find very high um, incidence of uh, aphthous ulcers among family members of patients with FAPA. So we hypothesize that perhaps those same variants are also linked to FAPA syndrome. So in order to uh, determine that, we screened three cohorts of individuals um, who had uh, FAPA syndrome for uh, uh, the, uh, those um, risk variants that were previously identified for Bechet's disease and recurrent aphthous ulcers. And we compared those variant frequencies to those among uh, Europeans in large databases. And we found that several of those variants were very strongly associated with FAPA syndrome, um, and those four are listed here. Um, the odds ratio for uh, the most, the strongest variant that we find, the IL-12A, was over two, which is quite strong for a complex uh, genetic disorder. 
the commonality of genetic risk variants for these three disorders, we believe puts them on a common spectrum. Um, so we propose to call that spectrum the Bechet spectrum disorders. Um, so on the Bechet spectrum, we have Bechet's disease on the most severe end. And on the mild end, we have recurrent aphthous ulcers. And then in the middle, there is PFAPA. Um, so there's uh, increasing severity along um, going up on this on the Bechet spectrum. And as we were uh, thinking about how to, you know, uh, put these ideas together, we realize that we actually see many patients who fall sort of in between these disorders. Um, and uh, so it kind of made sense that these disease entities are linked. For example, we see patients who have a clinical presentation consistent with FAPA, but they have vaginal ulcers or rashes during regular their regular fever flares, which gives them features of Bechet's disease. We also have patients who have recurrent aphthous ulcers and have, may have other systemic symptoms, but not fever. So don't quite rise to the definition of FAPA. Um, so put, having this spectrum sort of allows us to encompass these patients who may not clearly fit into one of these disease manifestations. So what are these risk variants that we identified for FAPA? So as I mentioned, the strongest risk variant we identified was upstream of this gene IL-12A, um, and the odds ratio was quite high. So IL-12A enco encodes the P35 subunit of a pro-inflammatory cytokine, IL-12, but also encodes the P35 subunit of an anti-inflammatory cytokine, IL-35, um, which is just starting to be uh, understood. So we wanted to understand how this risk variant affects uh, a, a person's production of IL-12. So in order to do that, we recruited patients from um, NIH blood bank um, and extracted monocytes, and we g extracted their monocytes. And we first, actually, we first genotyped them to determine whether they carried this risk uh, mutation. So uh, those who are homozygous um, for the reference allele, so they don't carry the risk variant, are in blue. Those with one copy of the risk variant are in red, and those with two copies of the risk variant are in green. And we um, took their monocytes and stimulated them with interferon gamma and LPS and measured the production of IL-12. And we found that people who had the even one or two copies of the risk variant uh, produced significantly more IL-12 and also produced significantly more IL-23. So this mutation does appear to have an effect on IL-12 production. Previously, uh, it's been found that this uh, risk mutation leads to increased STAT4 production. This risk variant leads to decreased IL-10 production, and this risk variant leads to decreased CCR1 expression. Um, CCR1 is a chemokine um, that attracts monocytes uh, to sites of inflammation. So it was hypothesized that perhaps decreased CCR1 reduces um, the monocyte migration to the epithelial layer and kind of compromises the integrity of the epithelium. But the a function of this risk variant is not as clearly understood. So in uh, uh, together, these risk variants lead to enhanced um, T cell CD4 positive T cell activation. So increased amounts of IL-12 in addition to elevated STAT4, which is um, how IL-12 signals, um, leads to increased skewing of CD4 positive T cells to a Th1 phenotype and thereby increased interferon gamma production. Um, and uh, if we look at Th17 cells, we see in more IL-23 and increased STAT4 also skews toward a Th17 and increased IL-17 production. And previously, people have found, um, several investigators have found that there's uh, evidence of enhanced Th1 activation during FAPA flares. So high expression of interferon gamma induced genes are found during flares. There's high levels of Th1 chemokines during in the flares, um, during flares in the blood and also in the tonsils at even non-flare periods. 
And we found that there's high expression of these subunits during on monocytes during a flare. So the pre previous findings about immune pathways that are activated during FAPA flares is uh, consistent with our findings of um, these genetic risk factors. In addition to those variants, we also looked to see if there were any HLA associations with FAPA, and we found both class one and class two associations in our cohort. And most of these were unique to FAPA um, uh, in that they weren't associated with Bechet's or aphthous ulcers. However, this one variant, HLA B1501, has been associated with Bechet's disease and recurrent aphthous ulcers. That is one of the ones that is the one that is in common with those two disorders. So because we find different HLA associations for each of the disorders on the Bechet spectrum, we think that HLA may be one factor that affects the phenotype of someone along the spectrum. In addition, Bechet's disease seems to have the strongest HLA association compared to aphthous ulcers where the HLA associations, this odd, odds ratio is not as strong. Um, as Dr. Lacamelli uh, pointed out, tonsillectomy um, is uh, highly effective in stopping fever episodes in many FAPA patients. So we also look to see if these uh, risk variants had some effect on um, the function of T cells in the tonsil. Um, the tonsils, these are the palatine tonsils that are located in the uh, back of the oropharynx. So we uh, sorted um, CD4 positive T cells from the tonsils of patients with FAPA and controls and found that there's elevated Th1 and Th17 related genes in the uh, among CD4 positive T cells, which fits with the uh, risk variants that we identified. We also found that upon stimulation of these CD4 positive T cells, there's enhanced production of interferon gamma and IL-17, um, also suggesting that patients with FAPA have uh, um, enhanced activation of Th1 and Th17 cells. Um, so I'll uh, stop there and um, turn it over to uh, Fatma, to Dr. Dario Glucksai. Thank you very much, Dr. Manjaram, for this fabulous speech. It was really great and informative. Thank you very much. Um, do you prefer and that I ask some of the questions that were asked right now, or um, is it better to wait for Dr. Dedeoglu to finish the speech, and then we can ask all the questions from both of you? I think, uh, um, you know, Kalpana, uh, do, you, uh, do you need to leave? I, I know you're no, very- I can, No, I can stay. I'll, so okay. can you continue? No problem. Um, so, so that would be I, great, yeah. So should, should... I guess we could do at the end then? Yeah, yeah. great, great. Okay. We will be here. Thank you very much. So um, we are honored to have Dr. Dede Glu here today and we are thrilled to hear your speech, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, let me just, uh, so this is, uh, this, is this my screen? I can't now no, tell. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Oh, okay, so, um, okay. You uh, want I think we can make it. <laughs> make it full screen it's not full screen yeah let if me do that it. and then uh here sorry i'm not as uh, good with it's okay. things that as young people are but uh, so uh, i don't think think, uh, you know, because this talk was uh, we shared so some of the uh, slides are mine i just uh, wanted to keep everything uh, all together so i'm gonna skip some slides uh, pretty quickly but uh, it's really i'm very excited to uh, be here again and um, share um um, you know, for the, our uh, experience with you guys. And um, this is uh, um, Dr. Montiram's uh, slide. So I'm just gonna skip this part because we weren't sure how uh, things gonna work. But um, so I, I need to um, um, talk about my disclosures. Um, these are uh, the disclosures. And the, the, in the, the treatment uh, part, uh, Dr. Lecamoli talked, but um, uh, we also should say that most of the treatment options for PFAP actually is, um, out of the label, uh, um, so. And uh, Dr. Lee Kamali discussed about the, um, uh, why uh, it can be an infectious uh, 
process or an auto-inflammatory process. So I will uh, skip this uh, too. Uh, and I, I think it, it, it is important to, uh, I, I like the history of uh, a disease when it is described and how it uh, evolves over time. Uh, I think more and more we think there's definitely immune dysregulation in PFAPA, but uh, even though uh, not a clear pathogen is shown, uh, it is still an enigma why this uh, disease happens uh, very regular cyclical ways. So uh, people are looking in the clock genes and so on, but those are more circadian uh, rhythm genes. So it is, uh, uh, you know, we need to um, still consider um, is there a combination of some uh, infectious trigger or a mouth flora changing in a, a susceptible genetically or immunologically susceptible host that is creating this cyclical process. Um, and uh, as uh, Dr. Mantram uh, elegantly uh, described uh, TH1 uh, cells, and these are actually shown in many other studies um, uh, previously, and uh, that interferon uh, gamma uh, related genes uh, and also um, TH1 uh, related genes are, um, uh, <clears throat> let me just turn off this, yeah. Sorry. Um, so uh, this is actually one of the original studies um, way back uh, showing uh, how a PFA, sorry, PFAPA patients in, during flare uh, can be differentiated from other periodic fever syndromes, uh, if you can see my cursors, and, uh, and also from uh, control, uh, healthy controls, as well as patients who are, uh, a, who are not in a PFAPA patients who are not in a flare, which are the blue dots here. Um, so uh, there are also multiple studies looking at the tonsillar pathology, uh, just the uh, staining how tonsils look. Uh, certainly, it is difficult to differentiate from other uh, tonsillar inflammation uh, conditions such as uh, recurrent tonsillitis or strep or uh, even obstructive sleep apnea, which um, even though th that, that is used in many studies as a control, they do have some changes as well. Um, and it mostly shows uh, reactive uh, lymphoid hyperplasia and, uh, and you can't really uh, differentiate um, <clears throat> uh, with the gross uh, pathology staining. Um, but one thing that I found, uh, this is a new article uh, looking at adult PFAPA patients and Dr. Mantiram, I uh, actually had a study looking at the tonsillar tissue, uh, she didn't show here, but um, uh, that PFAPA patients tonsils had smaller germinal centers uh, and um, and the, the farther away from their episode the size of the germinal center uh, uh, came close to uh, normal uh, or the control uh, subjects and interestingly this new um, uh, uh, study from adult patients that they looked at five P FAPA, uh, which all responded to surgery. Uh, and this is also an interesting uh, thing that in this study, their patients responded to uh, adult patients to surgery, uh, tonsillectomy um, <clears throat> uh, in terms of the resolution of their episodes, but um, uh, which is um, not the case in other series that adults seem to respond less. Um, <clears throat> but uh, again, uh, interesting things that they found similar uh, findings in um, uh, PFAPA tonsils or from adult smaller germinal centers. Uh, and I, I believe Dr. Uh, Mantaram can correct me if I'm um, saying uh, no, but she also found that there decreased number of CD8, maybe T cells um, and correlating with the adult uh, version. Um, and um, we also um, years ago uh, looked, tried to look at the microbiome of the tonsils um, uh, and uh, used uh, P six PFAPA tonsils and eight controls, which four of them are strep tonsillitis and four obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, in terms of microbiome, we did not really find any um, uh, any uh, difference or the, the old groups um, inf uh, either inflammatory because we were not at the time using real um, uh, uh, controls tonsils, um, it, we did not find a big difference in terms of microbiome, but uh, there's one interesting thing that we found in that small group 
that uh, TNF uh, receptor uh, superfamily 1A, uh, which is the uh, gene mutated in uh, TRAPS patient, uh, was um, more um, segregated with um, expression was higher in our PFAPA patient at the time. Um, so, uh, you know, the, that uh, we um, tried to see if this was also um, low, um, a, uh, seen in the um, pathology uh, of the uh, tonsils, but uh, there is really no difference in terms of um, the TN this TNF um, being uh, higher in PFAP or so. Uh, it was uh, though interesting. Again, there is some. Uh, then, then it was uh, located around dendritic uh, cells, um, <clears throat> uh, which uh, cell processes. I, I think it's just uh, related to how uh, communication of cells uh, may be um, happening. Um, and then um, while uh, preparing for today's talk, I uh, also found this um, uh, a new, uh, uh, a, you know, I mean, uh, Milieu article uh, on uh, microenvironment in the tonsillar tissue, and they also show that, that um, uh, PFAP uh, patients compared to recurrent pharyngitis had a higher IL-1 receptor antagonist and TNF. Um, and uh, they also looked at the microbiome. Again, microbiome studies are uh, still um, uh, very difficult to interpret. And as you know, from other diseases too, it's a very difficult area to study, but I think uh, it's something still we should uh, pursue. Uh, but they did uh, not find a um, big difference between control and PFAPA group, uh, especially in the alpha diversity, but there were some uh, signal uh, in the beta diversity, uh, which um, may again be connected. This is my um, hypothesis that um, the cyclical nature of the, um, the, the disease. Um, so, um, and then uh, we talked about uh, recurrence of periodic uh, PFAPA uh, and um, this uh, study by Renko uh, 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 group uh, looked at um, after tonsillectomy. These are all the patients who had tonsillectomies like 10 years before and about um, uh, 9.8 years later, uh, they uh, contacted and surveyed patients and looked at 132 uh, uh, so, um, uh, invited, but 71% uh, response rate. And uh, among that uh, 94 patient, they found that five of them had recurrence of their um, <clears throat> PFAPA uh, in later years or, um, uh, and which is, I, I would say uh, my, um, I, I didn't uh, look at our uh, core, um, heart data, but uh, I, that is almost my experience that about uh, um, around 5%, uh, I see that uh, recurrence happens. Uh, in my patients, I've seen if hundreds, a uh, couple of them returned um, uh, after five a, a teenage years. So I, I think this is something that we definitely see. Um, and um, this group actually interestingly found that uh, the, the four of these five patients had uh, regrowth of their palatin tonsils and actually they uh, uh, reoperated these patients and their episodes resolved again. Uh, so I, I don't know if um, uh, this is something I, th I th think we need to again look into if it is related to uh, regrowth or um, some other um, uh, process going on. Um, and then I'm just going to skip these microbiome slides because there are many studies. I just kept it there as a reference for people if we're interested in to look at, uh, but many detailed um, uh, studies are done uh, in both ton uh, in tonsillar tissue and uh, mouth uh, flora. Uh, and again, uh, nothing um, a, you know uh, comes out. Uh, every study has a, the studies are done a little differently and uh, different findings have been found. These are all in the um, literature. Uh, so I, we know that tonsillectomy helps and we, this definitely needs to uh, need to think about what the process uh, is, why is this happening? Uh, but uh, tonsillectomy is not, it's not unique to PFAPA. It can work with some other immune dysregulation problems such as palmoplantar pestilosis or IgA nephropathy. And, you know, we should continue to think about what is the connection. Um, and, um, 
Uh, and it's not always um, uh, creative in these disorders. So, so what is different in those patients? Um, uh, and then, uh, and um, I, I think again, uh, microbiome may play a role uh, in that, which uh, that's just, uh, I, I think. And um, uh, how can we do other studies? It's very, uh, one um, uh, limitation of the tonsillar studies in PFAPA is that it's obviously ethically, you cannot take the tonsils during an episode. So, uh, in the ideal uh, in theoretical world, uh, it would be uh, very uh, helpful uh, to co compare uh, flare and in between flare um, uh, periods of the tonsillar tissue, what's happening, but uh, that's obviously not uh, able to be done. Um, and so, uh, and then the other issue with the tonsillar studies was the uh, getting re uh, real normal tonsils uh, because uh, the comparisons are done with uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, I know uh, Dr. Mantiram is working on uh, that, that uh, there are uh, immunologic differences uh, way back in the 1980s or so that people looked at um, uh, uh, tonsillar tissue of obstructive sleep apnea patients, and there are um, differences for sure. So uh, the, the Dr. Um, Mantriam and uh, our group, Dr. Lecamoli, we are uh, trying to get um, uh, what we call normal tonsils when patients have uh, tonsillectomy is done during um, the during cleft palate repair or for some other reasons which then they do so trying to uh, study those as a comparison uh, and then we talked about the limitation of the tonsillar work uh, during febrile periods uh, and then some patients uh, even though they may be very close to their episode they may have received steroids uh, and some uh, may have received antibiotic even though we, this is a question when we collect tonsils we want to make sure they have not received um, antibiotics antibiotics uh, to include in the study, but uh, there may be factors that may affect the immune profile. So um, it's basically, it's still an unknown, uh, even though uh, there's a lot uh, done. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it seems a multifactorial uh, process though. And uh, we know that uh, TH1 and interferon and gamma uh, are important more uh, in, in many studies showing that. So we certainly learned a lot uh, and it is very clear that both innate and adaptive immunity plays a role in PFAPA a bit more than other periodic fever syndrome. So there's some unique about PFAPA in that uh, case. Um, so uh, it, it is very important to um, work together. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, so that uh, we can have uh, larger studies done, uh, looking at all kinds of uh, samples, uh, collections, and uh, getting uh, set up for this, which is not easy, but with collaborative work, I think it can be done. Um, I think um, uh, just for, for a few slides, I just wanted to recap and then uh, kind of emphasize um, um, and then we can talk about a little bit uh, the practical uh, things. Um, if there are questions, also I have some, a few things that um, in day to day, uh, what, how we deal with these patients that I can share with uh, you. Um, and, uh, you know, PFAPA is non hereditary, described by um, the Dr. Gary Marshall in 1987. And uh, two cardinal features are uh, how I uh, put the diagnosis of PFAPA. I really emphasize uh, uh, that it is regular periodic uh, process. And uh, I do see that there's a brisk rise in temperature in these patients generally. Uh, some uh, periodic fever syndromes or uh, undefined or other types, uh, some temperature may rise in a, in a day or so, but this and PFAP, I do think that it rises very briskly. Uh, and the uh, age group, uh, you know, with uh, majority uh, younger than five, but certainly we are seeing older age groups, which actually changed the criteria a little bit too. And also adults have been this Described very similar um, process uh, uh, symptoms. Um, and then uh, it certainly resolves a uh, uh, transient process, um, but uh, it can come back. Um, and uh, we, uh, there might be some geographical variations. Uh, we tried to look at that uh, several years ago uh, with a group of uh, collaborators in Turkey uh, that uh, were, uh, as you know, uh, familial Mediterranean fever is very end endemic. It's very uh, uh, common. So uh, there were some differences uh, in terms of presentation um, and um, <clears throat> with the uh, 
patients from United States and Turkey, that uh, younger age onset and shorter episodes. And uh, pharyngitis was more common uh, in um, <clears throat> uh, Turkish population. And obviously, they, uh, uh, those patients fit uh, the criteria, uh, classification criteria for a familial Mediterranean fever uh, of Euro fever criteria more so than uh, US uh, patients. Um, uh, I think these um, Dr. Lekamali went over these um, and um, uh, in terms of uh, treatment, how we decide, um, I, I think I saw a, um, a note, um, I, I saw a question about the, when to decide what to do. There is no really one right answer. Uh, it's usually a teamwork to decide how to uh, diagnose, how to treat or manage these patients um, and you know, family, family choices, uh, how it affects affects their daily routine, even though uh, PFAPA is seem to be a mild case, kids do, do grow well, it does affect the quality of life of uh, families uh, quite a bit. So uh, it is important to uh, manage these uh, patients. Um, and um, uh, it's a really a decision um, made together with the families. If there's any other indication for tonsillectomy, I might have a less um, uh, a lower threshold, or uh, if uh, things are working with just symptomatic therapy, why uh, do anything else uh, type of uh, decisions. Um. And um, because uh, all of these treatments are not studied, there are some uh, small randomized um, trials um, of uh, colchicine or uh, um, other treatments, and we know that tonsillectomy works. But still, uh, we wanted to get a better understanding of uh, how people, how patient um, physicians uh, approach PFAPA and treat. And there are also uh, infectious disease specialists who uh, uh, manages uh, PFAPA patients. Uh, so uh, uh, through our organization of Kara, um, uh, we uh, built up a team and uh, worked on these over the last uh, seven, eight years. And uh, I, I'm not going to go into detail of uh, the this because uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Lapidus and uh, uh, other uh, uh, Dr. Um, um, Markey and uh, um, Karen Durant will be talking about uh, this uh, these efforts uh, next week. Uh, but uh, we uh, try to understand first what uh, physicians do, uh, how they treat um, PFAPA. And uh, with this survey that uh, Dr. Manchiram uh, was also involved in, and actually this is her paper, uh, that uh, we, uh, for example, found that tonsillectomy is uh, uh, recommended more by uh, uh, infectious disease uh, physicians, while colchicine is used more pediatric rheumatologists, which I, I think uh, uh, makes sense. Uh, or, uh, you know, naturally not cautious and is used more by uh, rheumatologists. And then uh, by after this uh, and um, uh, survey and literature review, uh, we uh, des uh, designed uh, consensus treatment plans uh, and uh, had a more strict uh, in inclusion, uh, exclusion criteria to, to make sure that there's homogeneous group of patients are uh, looked at. And these are the arms. Again, I'm not going to uh, discuss in detail because Dr. Peters is going to talk about these uh, next week, um, and um, uh, they, we want to understand uh, if um, uh, they can compare these uh, groups in a, a pragmatic uh, uh, trial uh, uh, fashion. Um, and then criteria, uh, obviously there's diagnostic criteria and classification criteria for PFAPA. It's still being worked up. So um, basically uh, for clinical diagnostic criteria, we still use the um, uh, modified Marshall criteria, which is uh, in 1999 by uh, Thomas. Um, and um, this is uh, just uh, a classification criteria described uh, as a group of um, uh, experts uh, worked on uh, getting a classification criteria. Again, this is not a diagnostic criteria. And then uh, many others are coming out. So again, this is really uh, not, uh, um, you know, they are very similar to each other. Uh, um, uh, in the sense um, uh, that uh, the basic um, um, Thomas uh, criteria is uh, helpful. Uh, but I just want to share this, that um, a, this uh, group suggested that if you have five regular occurring fevers, even in the absence of aptostomatitis, pharyngitis, or cervical adenitis, and even you're older than five, you can have, you can call this uh, PFAPA. I think um, uh, some uh, of us, uh, you know, terminology is always um, 
uh, confusing. Uh, there is an entity called SURF, uh, syndrome of undefined recurrent fevers. Uh, so um, some uh, of us may consider this patient as a SURF and uh, Dr. Broderick group from uh, uh, San Diego actually look at these patients um, and uh, they do they do have a different um, in the tonsillar tissue they have a different uh, uh, even though it's IL1 it's a little different um, uh, profile but um, uh, many of those patients also responded to uh, tonsillectomy so uh, I think uh, kind of the plot thickens the more we uh, un try to understand uh, the more um, uh, questions come up so Thank you. I think this is where I will stop and um, the, uh, and try to you know uh, address any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your fabulous speech. It was really enjoyable and informative, Dr. Dedeoglu and dear Dr. Montiram. Now, if you uh, permit me, I will ask some of the questions, and we will be honored if you can answer them. Thank you very much. In fact, there are many questions here. And uh, okay, I will start with this one. Um, one of the professors asked uh, this, if the genetic is the main reason of PFAPA, how tonsillectomy is helpful in more than 75% of patients? Good question. So these risk variants, I think, may have a stronger effect in the tonsils um, because even along the uh, respiratory GI tract, the effect of certain risk variants, they're not within the gene themselves, they're in regulatory regions. It, they may have a different effect in different areas of the, of the GI tract. But I think one thing to note is that patients, even after tonsillectomy, typically most of them, I would say 60, 70% keep having recurrent aphthous ulcers. And there is a group of patients who have so-called feverless flares after tonsillectomy. So I think there, there, the pa people, patients do continue to have some episodes of inflammation, even after tonsillectomy, just milder. So they don't need treatment. They don't, um, they're, they don't come to the attention of, um, of physicians. So I guess the effect, one hypothesis is that the effect is the strongest in the oral mucosa. But the second thing is that they do, many do continue to have uh, manifestations of oral inflammation, just not uh, severe anymore to warrant treatment. Thank you very much. Good question. <laughs> yeah, it was intriguing really. And uh, okay, so um, there are two questions, I think, concerning the hypothesis that you uh, introduced in your speech. And um, they have asked, um, with uh, your hypothesis, do you recommend immunomodulator and biologic drugs for refractory PFAPA patients? Yes, this is another very good question. So I think the um, commonality of these genetic loci with uh, FAPA, Bechet's, and recurrent aphthous ulcers has opened up more ideas for how to treat these patients, especially these refractory patients. So um, I, so my just overall approach to treatment um, is initially I try medical management. So I try, you know, corticosteroid, especially to see that very uh, rapid resolution of the, of the flare with steroid is very useful. Then after that, it sort of is depends a little lot on the patient and the family and how intrusive it is to their uh, to their uh, well-being. So I typically try cimetidine first for prophylaxis. I find it more effective than colchicine, although maybe you have a slightly different patient population with more FMF risk variants um, around. But in our population in the US, I find more effect with cimetidine. So I typically try pro either prophylaxis, go to tonsillectomy, or continue um, episode steroid, depending on how severe the effects the, of the flares are and if the steroid increases the uh, frequency of flares. So if people don't respond to any of those treatments, so refractory to those treatments, those patients, um, the, our approach is depends sort of on what we need. So um, if the episodes are rare, we'll often give anakinra for 
uh, uh, ab aborting each episode um, in lieu of steroids. Um, I personally don't find anakinra quite as effective in, or magical as steroids as in just alleviating the flare, but it is helpful um, in many patients to reduce the severity of their, of their symptoms and they can you know, go to school or do the normal things that a child should get to do at this age. Um, if that doesn't work, other prophylactic options that have started started to come up in light of our uh, findings are um, a premolast. Uh, so uh, a premolast has been found to reduce the frequency and severity of oral ulcers in patients with Bechet's disease. Um, and so I use, uh, especially in those patients with some features of Bechet's, like genital ulcers or rashes or very severe ulcers. I tr often try a premolest and has, have found some um, uh, effect in th those patients. Um, other ideas that we ha I haven't tried in the more typical FAPA patients are um, uh, 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 IL-23 uh, um, or the P40 uh, uh, in inhibitors. Um, like ustekinumab. Um, so that could be another option. A JAK inhibitor may be another option as well. Ha I haven't tried those yet, so I, do I don't know if the those may be effective, but thinking about the pathogenesis that we found, I think those could be um, possibilities. I, I think in, uh, you know, for me day to day, like I do use colchicine a lot. And then sometimes you combine that with uh, the as needed steroids because colchicine also makes the episodes a bit milder or spread out. And then uh, you can use as needed steroids. I never, um, like I didn't get to, but Calpona obviously sees um, more uh, severe patients because they're sent to um, uh, the NIH and uh, uh, like this uh, approach usually works. Um, and and uh, I, I think uh, the, the thing with BFAPA is that I, I really look at it as uh, being a common variable immunodeficiency. Uh, and uh, even, you know, there's these risk factors, but there might be some other um, patients that in that group uh, that may end up having more monogenic forms. So we do look at for uh, patients, um, like do genetic testing. If you didn't do if uh, classic BFAPA patients, we don't usually send genetic testing, uh, but if uh, there's any any point that we're not seeing, um, you know, uh, the responses that we expect um, from uh, either st the steroids as much or other treatments, they do require higher um, treatments, um, then uh, we will look into um, the, the genetics if there's any other um, <clears throat> Risk um, gene, or uh, they have actually an um, undefined some monogenic form of uh, a, a process. Yeah, right, great. So, um... While we were talking about these um, treatments, uh, there were a couple of questions here. For example, um, we have a question asking, uh, can we use fomotidin instead of cimetidin for prophylaxis? Yeah, so I guess when um, the first reports came out, uh, cimetidine was being used. So I use mm -hmm. cimetidine primarily. Mm -hmm. However, um, there are some of my patients who are on famotidine and they seem to have an effect. So I think mm -hmm. um, the uh, histamine inhibition is there's no, I don't think there's something unique to cimetidine. I think that any um, H2 blocker should should work. And we've done a little bit of lab studies to see what those what they may be doing. And I think famotidine may have similar effects to cimetidine. So yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, right. uh, my um, uh, feel about cimetidine, like I haven't found it as effective, and but there are, I've certainly had like inherited patients who are on it and it works and um, well, but if you look at any study, it is about a quarter or uh, like 25, 30%. Uh, and I think to me, uh, there's um, maybe that group is unique that they're responsive to cement because the patients who respond, they really do like it aborts like almost on selectomy, like you don't have any more episodes. So um, uh, I feel that that group of patients are different. And uh, I actually don't know the details, but I thought that cimetidine might have other immunomodulatory effects different than famotidine, but I'm not sure about that. Actually, I should look into that. I think we haven't, uh, they, they, it may, um, cause, uh, but I think in, in the few patients who I've had on famotidine too, it seems just as effective. I actually find cimetidine to be probably the most useful in patients 
who have episodes after tonsillectomy, um, those patients, cimetidine, uh, I have to sometimes use a higher dose. So usually you used uh, 20 to 40 milligrams per kilo divided uh, BID or twice divided twice a day, um, maximum 600 milligrams twice a day. And those patients, even if it doesn't abort the uh, completely, sorry, doesn't completely stop the episodes, it makes mm -hmm. them less severe and less frequent to the point that they can use steroids to, um, to uh, get rid of each episode, or they're they're less so less um, their severity is so reduced that they don't need um, any medication at all, or they can manage with um, Tylenol or uh, acetaminophen or, ibup or um, ibuprofen. Yeah, I, I think you brought up a good point about the dosage because that's also important, right? Because sometimes we don't use enough dosing uh, that then we think it's not working uh, and it's not easy if it's metadine. I must admit that I don't think I'm using as a high because it's just, you have to divide it three, four times a day and so on. It's not that easy the compliance device. So one thing that doesn't, uh, it, when we say it doesn't work, it could be the delivery, the problem is in the delivery of the medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, have you had any experience um, in using anti leukotrienes like Montelukas for aborting the uh, episodes? Um, I had a few patients in the past. Um, mm. I mean, definitely, you know, what, when we heard about it, like we, I was using higher dose, so, you know, like you need to use so high, the double the dose. That was the uh, experience that, you know, anecdotally, that's how I used it. I don't think I found, but I, I don't think I've tried enough. And the, the few patients that I tried, I didn't see a big um, uh, change and that there were behavioral issues. Actually, this is something interesting. I mean, I'm going to share, this is all anecdotal stuff. Uh, the PFAPA patients uh, or uh, especially I feel uh, even with steroids they do seem to have a like a, this um, rage side effect of um, steroids seem to happen more like I don't know when I was doing general pediatrics I don't recall asthma patients having like these rage symptoms a lot like even though they <sighs> on it so I, I don't know what it, what it is but the same uh, with um, uh, Montalucasto I, I thought that they, they were having more behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Much effect. We asked in our that serve the questionnaire that um, Dr. Dedioglu presented, and I think most of the physicians who the few who said they had experience with it thought it wasn't very effective. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And um, we have uh, Dr. Shiari here. He is a pediatric rheumatologist at the Shahid Beheshti University, at Tehran, Iran, and um, he has uh, some interesting points and some points that he wanted to discuss with you, if you let me. I want to introduce Dr. Shiari, and then you can discuss some of these questions. Dr. Shiari, please. Yeah, hey, thank you very much. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, and uh, PFAPA is also my interesting uh, research. So uh, I do agree with you that uh, the PFAPA is not the infectious uh, reason because of the antibiotics doesn't work and also uh, the growth and development is everything okay. And also in the case of uh, maybe uh, something which is related to uh, genetics and I'm not so um, agree because uh, I, I guess uh, there is a very uh, various uh, genetic, uh, and we uh, we have a complicated disease. It's not that some of our patients uh, answer to uh, uh, food uh, uh, diets, and some of them answer to tonsillectomy. Some of them uh, very uh, good answer to colchicine. And I, I guess uh, we have to uh, find the border, and it's very important. And the, the things that uh, very uh, interesting that we uh, worked in uh, almost 32 patients uh, with definitive uh, PFAPA and uh, their genetics also was negative for MEFV gene. So we uh, calculated them and then used prick tests for allergy. And we noticed that uh, almost 27 of the 30, three patients, they had allergy to sesame and also uh, white uh, egg yolk and also in peanuts. And then we removed the allergen uh, 
almost more than more than 80 percent of our patients responds well to uh, remove of allergies. So if we think that uh, the tonsils is important, so we know that the specific T cells for allergy also is located in tonsils. So with removing the allergy, we guess maybe to help some of these group of patients. I would like to know your idea. That's, that's interesting that um, you saw that effect. I mean, I have not tried the removal of allergies in, um, in, these, in these patients. We see, we're seeing more of a Th1 response uh, in the tonsils, though we haven't, you know, very carefully queried to see if there may be a Th2. I haven't, I, did you see high IgE levels in any of these patients? Or we don't typically, I, I don't typically see eosinophilia during flares too, but I'm curious if you saw any um, changes in the eosinophils or IgE levels. Uh, exactly, the level of IgE also uh, was high in almost 85% of our patients. Wow. That's, why, that's why we think that, uh, you know, uh, if we think uh, that PFAPA is an auto-inflammatory disorder, the question coming that why uh, NSAIDs are not helpful to resolve the, these patients' fever, and that we just use it through it, which is really dramatic, give the re, uh, dramatic response. So by the way, uh, if we think that uh, the auto-inflammatory disorder itself will work, uh, in the case of biologics, that some of our colleagues ask, some, sometimes we use IL-1 blocker, someone we use uh, maybe tnf alpha blocker. I, I, I'm thinking that we are not uh, talking about a unique disease, that maybe we have a complex of the disease, including the genetics, environmental, maybe allergens, uh, like that. Yeah, I agree that I think FAPA is a complex disease and complex genetic disease, in my opinion, which means that you know, different genetic risk variants in different combinations may lead, and different environmental factors lead to different manifestations of the disease, which creates a lot of heterogeneity and, you know, and um, a little more difficulty and sometimes in determining the right management of the, of, I guess that's just the way it is in complex disorders. Yeah. I mean, it is, I think I agree, it's similar to JIA patients, you know, they we put them under the category, but they do also some respond to uh, IL-6 inhibition, some, some uh, do anti-TNF inhibition better. It's just, uh, uh, you know, certainly there are some indications, even though small, like geographical differences, um, make it, uh, make, um, uh, uh, yeah, difference in responses. So um, I agree, it's a complex, um, genetic, but also definitely environmental uh, factors. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Kosar, you are, I think you are muted. Uh, I'm so sorry. I just thank all of you. Thank Dr. Shiri and uh, thank both of you for the discussion. And uh, there are two questions here and uh, not far from uh, the topics that you were discussing now. And if you let me, I wanted to ask them. Uh, it was asked, uh, some patients have just fever without any specific syndrome. Some patients mimic FMF and some other patients show Bechet-like syndrome. Are there any differences between these groups on genetic background, treatment, and final outcome? And there's another question, I think, because it's related. What is your opinion about overlap syndrome, FMF plus PFAPA? So um, I guess first, what we're working on right now is getting enough patients to do a genome-wide association study for FAPA. So maybe after that, more of these questions could be answered of um, whether of because we selected risk variants to um, query in FAPA based on what was already reported. So if we could do a GWAS for FAPA, then we can um, look across the entire genome. And that might give us a better idea of how FAPA is related, not just to Bechet's, but 
maybe to FMF, um, because in Bechet's disease, um, the six, uh, uh, 694 uh, V um, variant in that is causative of in MEFV is uh, a risk, risk factor for Bechet's disease. So whether that's the case in FAPA as well, I don't know. Um, I mean, there have been, uh, so sorry, that's one of the first thing that you, uh, you raise a lot of questions here that I hope that we can answer in the next few years after we do a GWAS for FAPA. One of the things I also hope to do is link genotype to phenotype if possible, that you know, if you have a certain risk variant, are you more likely to respond to cymetic or tonsillectomy or have particular manifestations. So maybe if we have a large enough cohort and once we identify these patients, uh, identify these risk variants, we can answer that. Um, as far as MEFV um, as a uh, modulating uh, factor for FAPA, um, I think there have been, maybe Fatma has more experience uh, with this so she could answer that. I, so other, others have reported that there, there may be, I mean, that MEFV mutations may modulate the episodes and that they may be a little bit shorter, maybe a little more irregular. Um, uh, maybe Fatma has seen more of these uh, patients and could uh, would want to comment on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's certainly, the, as you said, uh, there's uh, the, the, from Israel and from Spain, the, the episodes may be shorter, start at younger age. And in our cohort, we saw that like pharyngitis were more common. And that, the, again, the same uh, in the patients so, uh, from Turkey and also in the group of uh, MEFE. But in that group, uh, the carriers versus not carriers in our group didn't have any difference in clinical presentation or response to therapy. But there's a recent um, uh, uh, cohort from Turkey uh, looked at uh, the response to tonsillectomy. For example, if you're a carrier of MEFV, your response may be not as good. Uh, and the consciousness response seemed to be a little better in the MEFV carriers. But is it all? it is also very important, maybe depends on which, uh, if it was exon 10 mutations, like if you carry E140HQ and exon 2 of MEFV, it may not be as, um, as a contributory. But uh, it's also important of the protein, the folding, because e 148 it is uh comes close to uh, 744, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, um, the uh, area uh, on the uh, um, MEFE gene. So it's, I think things are, uh, you know, uh, th these are very uh, difficult um, uh, things to tease out. But I, I think still we have uh, in front of us, we still have these patients come to us and uh, agree that, uh, you know, the spectrum is uh, uh, in, in the past, uh, maybe five years ago, I wouldn't have Send someone to tonsillectomy if they only had fever, even if they have regularly happening fevers, I would have hesitated uh, unless I exhausted other options. But after uh, seeing Dr. Broderick's um, paper, uh, I, you know, and there was also another uh, paper from Norway um, that uh, suggested even if you have just fevers, uh, tonsillectomy seemed to work in those patients uh, without other features. Uh, the features also is very interesting because PFAPA tonsils, uh, PFAPA Alpha mouth ulcers are very difficult to see if you really no, not looking carefully. So literature says is about 50%, 60% of those ulcers in PFAPA patients. But um, I do bring uh, patients during an episode, um, and even if it's going to cost them an episode, they, they won't take their steroid and they come to see me. And I do gag them. I use a tongue depressor and definitely uh, seen smaller ulcers that Dr. Lecamely mentioned in the back of the throat. Very small, like tiny bit, but it just uh, tells you, uh, you know, there are history, maybe uh, it, the kid doesn't drink and so on, but it's hard to tease those out. If you see that ulcer, then you know that it is probably more common uh, than we think. Um, <clears throat> so. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a very important question here. And uh, it's generally said that PFAPA is self-limited in early childhood. Have you had patients refer to you in adulthood or the ones that you followed from childhood into adulthood? And are there any differences in the presentations of these patients, the ones that are, are going to be um, progressive into adulthood from the ones who are aborted in the childhood? Yes, so I that we definitely have patients. Um, so in this uh, study from uh, my uh, previous mentor, Dr. Edwards from Vanderbilt, I think about 10% of their cohort when followed over almost almost 20 years, about 10% were having episodes into 
uh, beyond the uh, early adolescent phase. And I and I'm sure and, uh, I know Dr. Dedioglu also, we see quite a few patients like this. Um, so in my opinion, patients who continue to have flares later have more prominent abdominal pain and joint pain, headache. I don't know if it's because they're verbalizing it more or if I, I think these symptoms are more present as they're a little bit older. Um, there, I do follow several adults as well, um, who how, like if they were a child, I would say they, I mean, I do diagnose them as having FAPA, but they follow almost exactly what a young child would have as having FAPA without even more abdominal pain or joint pain or whatever. But so there's kind of two groups, but I would say a lot of the, pa the patients who start to start in early childhood and then continue to have episodes into their uh, teens, 20s, they tend to have a little bit more joint pain, abdominal pain, um, and headache, in my opinion, and, uh, oh, and most of them have ulcers as well. Um, and then there is another group of patients who start having episodes in their adulthood who sound just like a child, uh, you know, the children that we see with classic papa. Um, so uh, there's even there, there's a little bit of mystery in uh, understanding what's going on and what's different between these patients and uh, what their risk factors may be. Yeah, I think my experience is also very similar. There are definitely two, two or three groups. Like one, one of them is uh, the episodes, let's say they are treated, episodes are uh, seem to have resolved, but we call them feverless episodes. The fevers are gone, but they have other features uh, which are ongoing, maybe not as frequent, so they don't come back. Uh, and then they come back because all of a sudden, you know, they start having a bit more severe episodes. So I see those kind of patients uh, that uh, their history uh, is uh, before 10 years that, that didn't come back, that they had continued to have these feverless episodes. But there are also patients who have complete resolution, like for 10 years, nothing happened. And all of a sudden in high school, getting ready for college. And I real, I just, uh, I think different stressors, uh, most of the time, those that group, like senior year, going to college, uh, all of a sudden the episodes start coming back. They end up in the, uh, you know, ERs and so on. Very similar, exactly the same way they had it in the past. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, that's a good point. I agree with Fatma too. I think the episodes uh, when they are in uh, older children, their stress is more of a trigger and that um, the episodes tend to be a little bit more irregular. I think um, some of them do have very regular, but some, uh, I think there's just more of a tend to be a little more irregular then. Okay, great. I will ask one question and then I want to ask uh, Dr. Salehzadeh to join us and uh, discuss some points with you. Dr. Salehzadeh is a professor of pediatric rheumatology at Ardigal University of Medical Sciences, Iran, and he has been um, the moderator of our first session. And uh, there is only one question before I ask him to kindly join us. Um, it is asked if Beshet is more common in PFAPA patients. That's a good question. So I don't have a large enough cohort to say for certain, but I dev and I think I have a skewed view being at NIH with the referrals that we get. But I think in light of these findings, it does seem that, you know, Bechet's and FAPA are related. And we see many patients who uh, fall on that gray area between FAPA and Bechet's disease with genital ulcers, uh, pustular or papular rash, have a couple of patients who have um, uveitis, uh, who otherwise sound like having FAPA. So I think there's more to learn. Um, I think their genetics suggests that there that there may be a there may be um, they, that they have some commonalities in their pathogenesis. It's not common for a patient with FAPA to have Bechet's disease. I think in that study at Vanderbilt that looked at the outcomes of patients over about 15 to 20 years, one they reported one patient who had Bechet's disease out of, I believe it was somewhere between 50 to 60 patients they followed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, uh, but um, yeah, so I guess I don't know the, uh, like exactly what that risk factor is. There is some risk. It's not common, but I think there is some risk. Yeah, right. We had a, a similar question here because um, one of our pediatric rheumatologists shared um, her case. Um, she had um, a patient, um, a 
daughter of a father who had a Bechet disease with ophthalmic involvement for years. And then this daughter had a PFAPA with episodes responsive to single dose prednisolone and daily colchicine. And she was wondering if there was a chance that this daughter would um, have a Bechet in future. So there is a still concern about this and there should be more data, right? For Yes, I think that's all. This is a good, good, actually a really great example of how these diseases may be linked. Um, I mean, I would be curious what the HLA type is, because I think that is a potential uh, um, thing that can help us determine where you fall on the Bechet spectrum. This is all very early because before we do a GWAS for FAFA, it's a little, um, uh, I, do, I don't know ex uh, all the genes that are involved um, to determine a person's risk along the Bechet spectrum. So maybe in a few years, I could answer this question a little bit better. Um, but I, I think in, I, in Bechet's is, uh, she, she may be at higher risk for Bechet's disease and would I would follow that, but um, I don't know that you need to like change her management at this point, but I, I think knowing the HLA, um, her HLA type may be helpful. Yeah, right, right. I think she should do that. Yeah, she should check the HLA type. So I would like to invite Dr. Salazada to join us kindly because he wanted to ask. Questions. Hi, Dr. Salazar. It's an honor to see you here today. Uh, hi, Chris. Do you have my voice? Yes, clearly. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fatima Bedogli, uh, Dr. Greg, and Dr. Carl Pana. You all have a very wonderful presentation, and it was uh, wonderful and amazing uh, just talking about the PFAPA. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, I had research in 21 patients uh, who suffer from PFAPA, and I have checked uh, 12 common MIFT genes, mutations in 21 patients. Uh, uh, nearly 30 patients had MIFT mutations, and one patient uh, had uh, compound heterozygotes, uh, heterozygous mutations. But I didn't find any relationship uh, phenotypically and genetically between these two groups. I don't know, uh, you mentioned about the uh, difference phenotypical uh, and phenotypically and genetic, genetic uh, uh, findings in these patients. But in my experience, I didn't find any relationship. I think Dr. CIE could find this article uh, who published in the Iranian Pediatric Journal. And uh, I have a comment about the PFAPA and uh, Marshall syndrome, of course. I think PFAPA and Marshall syndrome is periodic fever, but it is not autoinflammatory. I'm not satisfied with this. This is as auto-inflammatory disorders. The main reason for this is two um, topic. One of these is which auto-inflammatory disorders goes to inactivation but age. I don't remember any auto-inflammatory disorders goes to inactivation by age. And second one is I don't remember any auto-inflammatory disorders have dramatic response to one dose of a steroid. A steroid may be effective, but long-term use, not single dose of steroids, face a dramatic response in auto-inflammatory disorder. Thank you very much if I have your comments about uh, my idea. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think you raise a good question, like how to define FAPA as auto, is it auto-inflammatory or not? I think in light of these, so I guess the, uh, in light of the genetic variants that we think may predispose, um, it may be kind of in, but let these variants kind of lead to heighten activation of, of certain innate immune pathways, maybe more IL-12 that skews now an adaptive, the adaptive section, so the uh, and T and T lymphocytes um, toward becoming more activated, um, and I think that question about 
not of of FAPA episodes being unique in that they resolve uh, and whether that makes them not auto-inflammatory, I guess I would think, I would um, say that they may not totally result because most patients with FAPA continue to have aftus ulcers later in their, uh, in their life. So maybe it doesn't, it, the severity uh, improves because the, the strongest um, trigger is in the, is in the tonsil or uh, the tonsils either are removed or they start becoming smaller with age. Um, but these infl the inflammatory cells may still be in the in a person and lead to after cells, so just different manifestations, I guess. Um, and maybe there's an environmental trigger in the in the tonsils that in a person with the right genetic uh, background. Um, can lead to the trigger. And if you remove that, remove the trigger, then um, the episodes can resolve. I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and once we better understand the pathogenesis, we might be able to uh, better define what it is as auto-inflammatory or not. Um, and then uh, I think with the and then I guess with the MEFV mutations and Fatma has more experience with seeing patients. I don't have many patients with uh, MEFV variants, just a few, um, but she could comment on that and on how to define FAPA too. I mean, I think these are really good points, Dr. Salazadeh. And uh, I, I think, um, uh, first of all, with the uh, steroid response, so that's why I don't use steroid response as a big criteria in my patients, just because I've seen good responses if, uh, pay, uh, with the steroids the same way, even uh, high, uh, um, hyper IgD syndrome or mevalonate kinase patients. Uh, we do see milder form of diseases in the United States. I think the genetic difference, genetic pool being more uh, diverse or so. I'm not sure what the cause, but uh, I've certainly seen a very, very typical uh, PFAPA response in um, MKD patients. And um, over uh, time into adulthood, for example, mevalonate kinase deficiency also can uh, be milder. Uh, and I, I know in uh, FMF patients, like in the, this is very late um, uh, when they are in uh, 50s or 60s, they are able to stop their culture scene because they don't have their attacks anymore. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about this, but the mosaicism may be a pro, uh, an issue because there are some auto-inflammatory conditions uh, evolve uh, in the adulthood. It starts in the adulthood because of the mosaicism, um, uh, like the like uh, vexus and uh, some other um, uh, conditions, like IL-1 um, caps can start uh, in, in the adulthood. Uh, so uh, I think there could be uh, issues with mosaicism in patients with PFAO that actually the opposite direction that may be um, uh, uh, contributing. Yeah. But these are all my um, hypotheses. <laughs> Not, uh, I don't know if there's anything to support. Um, but uh, MEFE, there's certainly in uh, the group from, uh, in our study, we didn't see any clinical differences in the MEFE positive or negative uh, patients in terms of response. But there are some uh, uh, reports that says the opposite. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So as- Thank you, did a good answers. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salazade. Thank you very you, much. You are welcome, you are welcome. Thank you. Okay, I should uh, sincerely thank Dr. Dedeoglu, Dr. Montiram, and of course, Dr. Leko Mili, please send my kind regards and my gratefulness towards him for this great uh, session and for uh, the great speeches and for the great discussions. I personally learned a lot today and I know my colleagues, uh, my colleagues also have. Uh, PFAPA is quite common and we have lots of questions and I think it was very well covered today. And um, I should declare that collaborating with you um, has been an honor and I have learned a lot and I wish I can uh, learn lots in the future from uh, Dr. Dedeglu and Dr. Montiram. And thank you, thank you very much. And also I'm uh, grateful for participation of all you academics today in the second session of How I Treat Auto-Inflammatory Disorders course. I hope uh, you have had an enjoyable time. Uh, we will share the post-test later with the participants and then we can send the certificates 
As I mentioned before, the certificates are approved and validated by Asia Pacific League of Associations for Rheumatology or OFLAR, Pediatric Rheumatology Society of Iran, Iranian Rheumatology Association, and Tehran University of Medical Sciences. And uh, we invite you all to our next session, which is going to be held uh, next Friday, entitled as uh, Network Development for Autoinflammatory Disorders and Patient Education. Uh, you can find the details on the next session in, in our uh, website. And uh, you can see the link in the chat forum. I'm going to share the link here in the chat forum. Um, and uh, Dr. Dedeoglu and Dr. Uh, Montiram, do you have any more comments? It was a real uh, honor for us to see you here today. A great pleasure. Yeah, I, I really, I, you know, this is very stimulating and engaging. I really thank everyone. Like, uh, you know, it's just like, it makes it uh, such a fun and to discuss and, uh, you know, uh, brainstorm together. And I, uh, I was uh, very, very wonderful. And I thank Dr. Manturam uh, specifically because she, she just has a baby and she's very busy and oh, coming on and sharing her expertise. She's the best. <laughs> and, yeah, she she and everyone, like I really, this is uh, amazing questions, amazing, stimulating. And I really enjoyed it a lot. Thank you very much. It was yeah, such a pleasure to be here. And thank you for your very great questions. And as uh, Dr. Dedioglu said, very stimulating and um, I'm really ha happy to have had this opportunity and always good to see Dr. Deddy Oglu who's one of my mentors too, so. Yeah, it was, it was great, thank you. Thank you both very much. And um, we will be very grateful if you and the participants can fill in the feedback form we shared in the chat room. Thank you very much. And thank you again, our dear Dr. Deddy Oglu and Dr. Monty Ram and hope you all will have a great day. Thank you very much for participating today. Have a nice weekend. Bye. You too. Goodbye. Bye.